how did a uh, cool Herc inspire you? Cool Herc is an amazing person, man. I met him several times. You know, I was in Jamaica with him the other day. Um, oh wow! Uh, he's uh, here's a guy that really took the cultures of reggae toasting and brought it over to the Bronx, and kind of did the same thing on 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 top of R and B beats. You know, which kind of evolved into what we know today is what is hip hop. Um, you know, you know, dance all and reggae culture is that kind of culture. Every a lot of genres come from it. You know, you look at reggaeton that really came from uh El General and this kid called Gringo, who really started it out of Brooklyn. And they used to do really um I think when El General was really who got popular, popularized it by doing uh, dancehall beat, dancehall songs um, over in in Spanish. Uh, you know, they did those Chaparangs records, Little Lenny records. Matter of fact, the um, reggaeton beat, which is Dembo, you know, comes from Chaparangs record Dembo. You know, uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Carl that used to be a VP record that started to do, uh, you know, he was the one that was recording El General at the time. And, you know, he, he gave the name to, to the, the, the genre, you know, cause they used to call it Spanish reggae and he called it, he said we should name it and call it reggae tone. And throughout the mispronunciation of it, it became reggaeton, reggaeton, reggaeton. You know, so that was the early stages of it, which is now a massive genre, you know, right. um, all started out of dancehall. You know, you look at what is going on even in Africa now, uh, you know, a lot of it is influenced, uh, the, the, the Afrobeat is influenced by dancehall, early dancehall records. We used to play massive stadiums back in the day, even though Africa is such a cultural place. Most of the dominant music then was played was dancehall for a lot of the younger kids in, in Kenya and, um, you know, uh, Uganda, you know, Tanzania, Nigeria, you know, dancehall was a big part of it. So it's, it's, you know, the art form has, has given birth to a lot of, lot of different genres. Definitely. And, um, I think in, well, your first job was working at a Baskin Robbins. I actually work at Baskin Robbins. I worked at Baskin Robbins for one day. Oh, <laughs> literally one day. I put the apron. I put it on. I put the apron, the little apron on, and the little idiot hat. <laughs> and you know, I I started to serve some ice cream, and then I realized cute girls come and want ice cream, and I'm like, I ain't serving no ice cream. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> that was it. I literally didn't go back. You know, and the guy, gonna... the guy and the guy that day was like, yo, great job. You were so great today. I was like, yeah, yo, yeah. See you tomorrow morning. Gave me the time to come back and I never showed up. <laughs> I was going to bond with you over their bomb ice cream, but never mind. <laughs> I lasted one day. I'm sorry. <laughs> I knew it wasn't for me. No. That's hilarious. All right. So then a year later, I think you were discovered um, singing in the streets with friends. Can you bring us back to that moment? No, I wasn't discovered in the street. It was friends. Not at all. Um, no, I said, oh, you were discovered while singing in the streets. No, nah, not at all. Not oh, at all. no, just kidding. They gave you some, they gave you some information. I used to you be. You took singing lessons. I, I know. I used to be, <laughs> I used to be in, I went to Erasmus Hall High School. And we used to have lunch rooms where each person would have a clique. So you'd have a the Panamanian clique, the Haitian clique, the Jamaican clique. You know, uh, the Puerto Rican clique and everybody would beat the bench and spit lyrics. And I started doing that because I realized I got attention when I, when I rhymed and I, I was freestyle. I look at a girl and talk about her, her hearing her bag or shoes. And then I get their number. And I was very popular in school for that because <laughs> I rhymed well and I make them very funny. And then right across the other bench over there would be El General, and he'd be doing his spitting in uh, in Spanish for his Dominican clique. And then there's this guy by the name of uh, Kingsley that called me, 
and knew that I was very popular in school, spitting these lyrics at lunchtime, that he brought me over to a sound system called Gibraltar. And uh, where I met this guy called Rossi, who is currently my road manager. And then I started to spit on his sound system. And I was just that good that the first dance I came and spit, everybody was like, who the hell is this guy? And overnight I was popular within the community. Then I just started doing uh, records um, with a local producer by the name of Don Juan um, out of uh, out of Brooklyn. And uh, I kept going until I... So, you know, when I, the first time I go into one of those dances, um, you know, everybody was asking, who is this guy? Who is this guy? So overnight, you know, uh, everybody kind of know my name in Brooklyn, you know, and um, I, I ran into this guy called Sting International, who was also a big DJ on the radio station. And we started to make some records. And, uh, you know, I did a record called uh, Mompi for a producer by the name of uh, Philip Smart. And that record became my first hit incidentally at the time i was in the military when that record happened so a lot of people didn't know who i was but the record was blowing up and uh you know it wasn't until i got out the military that i did another song called big up and that record also was a massive record within the streets and i was uh you know doing shows and getting really popular that kind of crossed over into england a place like that and then I ended up uh, doing another song now called Oh Carolina. That record blew up and uh, called the Eye of Greensleeve Records. And they uh, put it out. They had major distribution through BMG. At the time, I was touring with a, another massive superstar called Maxi Priest at the time. And I was doing background for him. So I was kind of learning the trades as I go along with him. And then my record became so massive that now it was going into the British chart. And I went over there and we got our first number one. And then I was signed um, by Ken Berry at Virgin Records for at that time, reportedly the highest signing ever in the history of dance hall and reggae. We signed wow. for over a million pounds at that time. Wow. How did that feel? Uh, it was great. First time I had you know, money of, you know, that nature, I would think. I just figured to myself that if uh, if I never made another hit, I was going to open like a shoe store or something like that and buy a house and get a, so I bought a house and moved my mom. And I was like, if I never make another one, this is good. Cause I knew people at that time worked a whole lifetime. I never made a million dollars. So, you know, I did that on this one record. So to me, I was like, okay, I was ahead of the game, but then, you know, it was a two album firm. So I had to deliver now by contract, I had to deliver another album. And the next song I wrote was a song called Mr. Boombastic. Right. And um, I put that out and it debuted at number one in the British chart. First day out, it debuted at number one. And then we ended up selling double platinum on that. And, you know, they gave me another million. <laughs> so, <laughs> At that point, I was like, okay, I can get used to this, you know? <laughs> right. Maybe I, have Man. A Maybe I have a career, you know? So I just kind of went with it. Fun fact, uh, Big Up is actually Vlad's favorite Shaggy song ever. He would always play it during his DJ set. Get out of here. Yeah, hey, big, big, big uh, club anthem. Dance all club anthem. Uh, and it was a massive record. That's beautiful. Um, real quick, before we get into the music, because I definitely want to touch on your time in the military. You enlisted in the United States Marine Corps in 1988, obtained the MOS of 0811. How was that part of your life? Uh, mad respect, because obviously you have to go through a ton of training and whatnot. But what was Shaggy like then? And how was, yeah, what was, what was, um, you know? You know, the military prepared me for uh, what for my journey. I didn't, you know, this journey of music. You know, in being a dancehall artist in 1993, when when I had O Carolina, I quickly realized that um, 
my genre wasn't a major genre and I, I had to work 10 times harder than the average genre of music, uh, the average artist in another genre. I realized that I have to work 10 times harder, make records 10 times better and get 10 times less sleep just to have a level playing field because, you know, dance all and reggae was not a mainstream um, art form. You know, it wasn't a, a, a genre that was played on mainstream radio. You got iHeartRadio to this day has over 900 stations and zero of those stations are reggae stations. You know, so how do a guy like me get to be on the radio and sell numbers like, you know, NSYNC and Britney Spears or any of these guys when they don't even play the genre? You know, it simply means that I had to just I realized I, I couldn't just be a star. I had to be a, a superstar. You know, you have to be a star with superhero like talents and presence and work ethic, you know, uh, but just to even get played. So I just made these records that were just so undeniable that radio had to play it because the streets were, 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 were making noise about them. So they had to. So I never really made records like pop records for pop radio. I just made records, reggae records that I know would work in the street, but they had that crossover appeal. And then those records ended transcending into being pop anthems. Wow. That's crazy that you, yeah, perfected your singing voice while you were in the Marine Corps. That's Yeah, I, actually I used to run and sing Cadence. No. Uh, yeah, so I used, to, I used to go like, I don't know, but I've been told my CEO wears pantyhose. Oh so, I would, so I would make up these really funny cadences because they would call me out to sing cadences all the time. And wow. I didn't know that, that that was really vocal training because you're singing from your, you know, from your gut and running for like four miles and singing and stuff like that. That's beautiful. Real quick, um, did you see any battle during De Desert Storm? I was in the middle of, yes, in 19, uh, in the first Gulf War. I, uh, we were in um, Saudi Arabia and we advanced into um, Iraq uh, throughout that time. I was out there for about seven months and, um, you know, we were in the midst of it. You know, the, the majority of the war kind of took place within a three to four year period of heavy bombing. We were heavily involved in that. But uh, yeah, it was, you know, it was really just great to come back home with all my limbs. <laughs> Definitely. Can't even imagine. Um, and then how was it? I guess, yeah, you mentioned Big Up and then uh, your next single. Well, how was it releasing Pure Pleasure? That was your first album. Pure Pleasure was cool, man. You know, it, it had a couple of cuts that was released, like Big Up and Mompy, a couple of these records, but it was really nice to be in studio making a body of work this time, you know? And uh, and I had great people to guide me at that time. I had Robert Livingston who was managing me and, uh, you know, Stig International was the producer at that time. And, you know, he was a DJ. So, uh, you know, I had some I had people who just, you know, would stare at me, Philip Smart, a couple other people who kind of stare at me and, and cultivating the album in the way it should be. Definitely. Um, and then you released Original Doberman, uh, your second album. Well, Original Doberman was actually the first, the first album that was on, was on um, uh, Don Juan's label, which was really a compilation of some old stuff that I had that he put out. And then Pure Pleasure was actually the first, my first uh, full-length album. 